Greetings, traveler. Hey guys, what's up? Now that all the cards of the Knights of the Frozen Throne expansion have been released, it's time for me to make a video on it. The complete card review I've already done on stream, and I will link back to it in the video description. It's more than two hours, and it is my, for at least a lot of cards, my initial reaction to them. I try to avoid almost every card when it was released, so I had the uh, vanilla reaction ready for you guys. So some cards will be like, wow, this is crazy. Oh, never mind, that's how it works. So it'll be, it's quite fun, it's quite, quite a journey. So what I wanted to make for you guys uh, now is a more condensed version of that. I'm only going to be talking about cards that I think are gonna be uh, relevant or even meta-defining. So we're gonna skip over some of the fillers slash you know decent cards but maybe not as crazy and we're going to be talking more about um, either stuff that's really going to define the meta or uh, cards that are going to contribute to pushing the meta in a certain direction so let me first talk about that and then uh, we'll get into it so the a recurring theme especially in the neutral cards is a buffing Right, we'll go over all the cards later, but let's just say if you haven't seen anything of the new expansion, you're going to be heavily rewarded for board control. In my initial review, maybe I was a little too skeptical of the set. I saw a lot of really powerful effects, but in a way, the, um, the really reward you for board control does take the set a little bit back to earlier of... Um, uh, the earlier arena state where it was all about the board and the, the guy that had the board would win and as you all know uh, in, in Ungoro that is not necessarily true with you know Meteor being super common allowing you to bail and get the board Vine Cleaver allowing you to just get the board um, Primordial Drake pfft, like no board control no problem pfft, he's a 4-8 and all your shit is dead right so right now there's a lot of really powerful effects where I feel that the moment you get snowballing, it might be so much that you just, you know, kill your opponent before they get to play a lot of these really powerful uh, combat cards. So as always, we're going to have to see, we're going to have to experience it. I'll be uploading videos after the expansion's out once I feel like I have a decent handle on the meta. All right, well, without further ado, let's get to it. I'm going to start uh, from the bottom up. Uh, starting with the neutral commons and rares, epics, legendaries uh, into uh, the glass cards. All right, so I'll grab my notes here. The first, uh, the first one, the one drop here, Archer is veteran. This card on its own isn't going to, uh, you know, win a game, but it's the start of the theme we spoke about, right? Leaving minions on the board is now going to get punished. Uh, this gives a friendly minion plus one attack and it's a one mana two one so when we would compare that right in, in normal one drops that's a pretty good one drop right one mana two one is properly statted and then giving a minion plus one attack that is a good effect um, now i think it's going to be extra important because there are very very few two drops in the set there's only one real two drop i'll go over it in a bit um, so having board control because of these buffs and because of the fewer two drops is going to be really important. So I will definitely be experimenting with picking up a few more ones or picking up all the early game I can and see how that pans out, see if I can get board control more often than my opponent. And the uh, Archer's Veteran does or could play a part in that. Next up we have the Fallen Sun Cleric. Not really the two drop I was referring to because obviously its stats are only a two one. But once again, the theme continues. It gives a friendly minion plus one plus one. Now, especially in light of the cards that are about to be <laughs> reviewed, I don't think this is crazy at all. But as I said, it contributes to that whole vibe. If you leave something on the board, you're going to get punished very often. So it's just another card you can keep in the back of your mind. Oh, turn two, you know, should I, should I ping this off or should I counter develop? Sometimes, uh, or most of the times, it might be better to ping off the opponent's minion rather than to counter develop. A, a good example is your opponent has played a 2-1 minion, then the, the standard as the mage 
is you, you reply with the 2, 3 rather than the hero power, but now you may get punished there where your opponent develops a Fallen Sun Cleric, the 2, 1 turns into a 3, 2, now can trade into your 2, 3, and right, you've lost the card rather than taking a free kill, and you haven't really gained that much tempo. The only thing that happened is your opponent had to play a 2, 1 over potentially a 3, 2, or a 2, 3, which he probably didn't have in his hand anyway, because there's not a lot of 2 drops. So, also worth mentioning because of that. Then next up, not really meta-defining, but just the only neutral 2-drop really in the set. Tuscar Fisherman, a River Croc with upside, giving a friendly minion plus 1 spell damage. Nothing too crazy, but I thought he deserved a little bit of a mention, seeing as he is pretty much going to be the only 2-drop. Uh, the only two drop You're going to be picking to play on turn 2 standalone, right? Alright, next up we got the Hildnir Frost Rider. Ogre Brute, anyone? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, especially because of the lack of 2-drops, I don't think the effect is going to hurt you as much. Um, you need to freeze all your other minions, but if you don't play a 2-drop, then that's a 3-mana 4-4. Four, four. And, as I said, the theme is really going to be snowball -y buffing. If you play a 4-4 four, four on turn 3, it is unlikely your opponent can remove that straight away, slash out-develop it, and then it's your turn to start buffing that 4-4, work with it and you know, get the snowball rolling and then get multiple buff effects going. The next card um, definitely sets the, uh, sets the tone. Uh, it's called Death Speaker. Uh, Battlecry, give a friendly minion immune this turn. So that is a perfect example of why it is going to be so important to get board control. In Ungoro, it hasn't really been that important to have initiative be the, uh, be the attacker. You know, we've had cards like Tar Creeper, you know, just throw it on the board, you can stall, you can defend. But when your opponent starts playing cards like Death Speaker on their minions, it starts to become very important that you're the one that has initiative and gets all these sweet benefits because you're not going to be able to withstand turn after turn this buff effect coming down. You're going to lose board. Right, um, even if you have some fancy taunt minions. So in, in my initial review of the set, I looked at a lot of taunts and was like, ah, oh, this is kind of annoying, they're really slowing down the game. But then upon further reviewing, there's just so many buff effects that just being the defender and sitting back probably isn't going to work because these, these buff effects are just gonna come down uh, you know, as a barrage and just having, having a taunt is probably not gonna be enough. All right, let's move up, shall we? Mm, next up, we got the Grave Shambler. I don't think this card is super ridiculous, but it's just something we can look out for in Rogue. Um, good example is the dagger comes down on turn two because you know a lot of two drops. Then you play your three drop. Then on turn four, you play Shambler. You finish off your weapon, right? You um, you attack the face or you attack a minion. Your dagger dies. You've now played a 4 mana 5-5. Five five. That's pretty good. So in Rogue and in you know in the Paladin deck or Shaman deck or Warrior deck, where you do have access to a lot of weapons, this could definitely be you know something to um, be scared of. As we said, the board control is gonna be super important, and then if you're the one playing a 4 mana 5-5, five five, well, you know, you are probably going to have board control. All right, next up, the Sunborn Valkyr. Another perfect example of why board control will be rewarded so much. At a five mana five four, the stats are not great. Uh, you can compare it to a Booty Bay Bodyguard without Taunt, which still sometimes finds its way into my draft just because, you know, five mana five four sometimes is better than whatever else is offered, but the effect is huge giving uh, two extra health to adjacent minions, which means that if you've already been able to accumulate the lead through previous uses of buffs or you know developing a three mana four four, if you can land this on two minions, that is huge, right? Especially if the buffs are relevant. If that allows you to free kill your opponent's minion, you um, disable his access to buffs, your minion survives next turn, you can heal it up, buff it some more, make it immune, all these nice things. And at five damage itself, it does stay somewhat relevant in trading into your opponent's turn five, um, should it be a five and a five five, which 
there definitely is one up in the set, uh, which we'll be speaking about right now. The Cobalt Scalebane. Just a good card, right? The, the, the first time I looked at this, I was like, wow, that's a 5 mana 5-5 five five with just pure upside. It's not among the, it's not on the, it's not as powerful as a nesting rock. The first time I saw nesting rock, I was like, this is insane, right? It's got seven health as a five drop, four damage is totally relevant, and it has potential upside. But uh, the Cobalt Scale Bane goes off every time you just have a minion survive, right? Uh, if you have a minion next to this Cobalt Scale Bane at the end of your turn, you're giving plus three attack to it. That's, you know, that's not Master Swordsmith category, right? That's plus three attack. To put that into perspective, your Yeti now has seven damage. <laughs> you know, your Yeti can now trade into a Boulder Fist Ogre. That is significant, right? It's not something like, ah, you know. So yeah, I think I think this card may have been glossed over by, by some people when you initially, you know, look at the set, ah, five out of five, five, not so bad. But you know, once again, if you do have that lead on the board, just giving something, uh, giving something plus three attack, that is super relevant. All right, um, okay, next up we have the, um, I wasn't really sure if I should include this one, but the thing is that it's it's not, it, it depends on your deck how good this card is gonna be. I'm talking about the Skelemancer. This card is a five mana two two, and only when it dies on your opponent's turn, the death rattle goes off. And the death rattle is summon an eight eight. Now, obviously, if the text on the card was 5 mana 2 2 death threat of 7 and 8 8, that's pretty darn good, you know? So, with this card, it's going to depend whether you can uh, buff it up, make it relevant, and force your opponent to either deal with it or continue to buff it. Say, with a Cobalt Scale Bane, your 5 mana 2 2 is now a 5 mana 5 2. If they don't deal with it, you now have an Ice Rager which you can attack the face with. Um, if you are a Paladin and you have a Spike Rich Steed, you play this on turn 5, then you play a Steed on it. You can see how that's super problematic if you don't have a card like Polymorph or a Silence effect. So that's the reason why I'm not 100% sure to include it, is that it's going to depend on your deck. Do you have uh, a lot of buff effects? Can you give this minion Taunt? Um, that's going to increase its worth. Otherwise, people will just, you know, they'll just be ignoring the minion. All right. Uh, Necrotic Geist is another one which I'm not 100% sure whether it'll do that much because it feels that at 6 mana, 5 3, this card needs to cash in, you know, at least I would like to have two minions die, right? And then. That's, that's pretty darn good, then you summon two extra 2-2s. Two um, it's got three health itself, so it is quite easy to deal with. But once again, you're going to need that board control. So the reason why I'm not really sure whether this card is going to be that good is because it feels like at six mana on that turn, you should probably already have the board. But think of a scenario where your opponent just has to play a minion into your board because you've accumulated a board lead, you play the Necrotic Geist, and that uh, bad trade that was on the board, say your opponent uh, plays a 6-6, and you happen to have a 4-3 and a 2-3 on the board, that's not really a trade you want to take, and your opponent's like, well, I can kill it, but at least it kills two of his guys. Now, if you play Necrotic Geist, you get two additional 2-2s two on top of it, and then that card is, is super, you know, super decent, right? You get a 6-mana 5-3, get two extra two twos uh, with upside so that's that's going to be the 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 thing right are you going to need that extra push at the end game I, I think it's still going to see play and i think it's still going to be useful but i'm not an, exactly sure how powerful it is which is not something that can be said from the next card which is bone bear <laughs> this you know this was a card like i said i tried to not really look at the cards before they were released, but it was impossible to get around Bone Mare. It was everywhere. People would be like, oh my god, this is crazy. And with good reason. At seven mana, five five body, little underwhelming, but you essentially just give a friendly minion blessing of kings and you give it taunt. 
the taunt aspect is what really pushes it hard because it means that it protects itself uh, at a 5-5 body for 7 mana. It won't be able to get counter traded. And almost anything you've buffed will be pretty darn relevant. Even, you know, if it's a river croc, um, you got a 2 mana 2-3, two, suddenly so becomes a boulder fist ogre with taunt. That's a pretty good card. Um, it also means that you can't go face, which at that point, when your opponent has gotten a combo like this off, a lot of the time it's not really feasible to get control of the board back. But because Bone Mare gives taunt, you don't really give your opponent the option to go face. So you either have a removal in your hand, you have an insane lead on the board where it doesn't matter, but if you had a lead on the board, then why did your opponent get Bone Mare off in the first place? Maybe turn 9, he plays it out of his hand, whatever. Um, or you're just screwed, right? That's, that's essentially your options. You either have a removal ready to go, you already are really far on the board, or you're just screwed because, you know, good luck getting the board back after a swing like that. You're gonna need, you know, you're gonna need good cards out of hand. So it feels that for most decks, once your opponent is ahead, it's gonna feel really demoralizing because you're just gonna, it's gonna get worse and worse and worse and worse with, you know, they get a Cobalt Scalebane off, it sticks around, they, um, uh, what's it called, they're gonna get a Death Speaker off, their, their lead now increases because their, their minion that survived now killed your minion for free. And then to top it off, Bone Mare comes down and you know now it's, it, it just looks fairly hopeless from that point where so many stats come down and there's also taunt so you can't even go face anymore. All right, so yeah, uh, definitely a meta-defining card. Super strong and it's, like I said, it's really going to incentivize um, board control so that's why I'm going to be experimenting with just trying to get as good as a curve as I can because it seems that a ton of the cards in the set are going to reward um, being in control of the board which usually happens because you had a better curve than your opponent. Alright guys that was it for the comments now move on to the rares. Uh, first one here is the Shallow Gravedigger. Uh, 3 mana 3 1 not so great in terms of tempo so it's not a card that you really want to play on turn three but it's a, a super reasonable card to play later on especially if your opponent doesn't have uh, a ping ability so this is a this is one of those cards comparable to like a, a loot hoarder but you can you can just really high roll the card once again i don't think it's going to be meta defining but i think it's going to be a, a reasonable addition to a deck that already has curve but just once either a little bit more chance to play something on turn three or just wants a little bit more gas. And this card can do both. So like I said, I don't think it's gonna to be too crazy, but it's, going to, it's definitely gonna be annoying when your opponent does high roll this card and then gets a very powerful Death Rattle minion. Um, you know, let's say in a value, uh, in a value situation, you, you play this, it pulls you uh, Cairn and now you play Cairn and that's, that's a lot of value out of one card all of a sudden. All right, next up we got Mindbreaker, a three mana two five. Now that body, as opposed to the Shallow Grave Diggers, is very well statted. Uh, two five on turn three looks really good. Like we said, anything that survives is going to give you a, a big chance of getting buffs off. So um, I feel like Mindbreaker is going to be really good, um, but we already know this from the past. Uh, Carrion Grub was really good. Druid of the Flame was really good. These are three mana two fives. Now they have a neutral three mana two five, but that's not all. It also has a useful effect. Well, depending on <laughs> what the situation you're in, of course, but you'll manipulate it to your advantage. Uh, hero powers are now disabled. So imagine that your mage opponent was planning on hero powering, um, you know, a, a two three that free killed a 2-2 two, two to turn after, right? Let's say they were planning on hero powering it on turn four, but then on your turn three, you play Mindbreaker, boom, suddenly their entire game plan is ruined. And you know you might see them flow two mana. And because you're the person playing this, it's almost always gonna be more convenient for you than for your opponents, because you can plan for it, you can, you can play around it. So yeah, good card. Can definitely see this being drafted a lot in the new expansion. Next up is Happy Ghoul. 
at a three mana three three it's not really overwhelming but <laughs> here's the big the big but right um it's for it's free if your hero has been healed this turn so what does that mean if turn two right turn one you've played a two one against the priest the priest turn two heals his face suddenly plays a happy goal for free um turn four a paladin uses true silver champion to kill your minion if the heal goes off suddenly his turn four is play true silver champion ugh, play true silver champion and get a happy ghoul out right so with and obviously there's there's lifesteal um that's going to affect this as well so it's going to be a reasonable card because it's a three mana three three and in some decks it's just going to be crazy because as we as we talked about it's going to be super important to get the board and if you just happen to play a zero mana three three that's going to heavily increase your chances to have something on the board and to get board control from that all right uh, next up serenite chain gang i initially didn't think this card was that good and i still don't think it's that great but the fact that you split the bodies up once again may increase the chance that one of them survives and then allows you to land a buff on them it's going to be dependent on how your situation is in the game of course um, you know if you play this and, and it's uh, it's on into an empty board it's obviously good because then maybe the turn after you can land the uh, Valkyr, the uh, Sunborn Valkyr, give both of them plus two health, and suddenly you have two two fives with Taunt, who then you know make it through the turn again and then get eligible for other buffs. But if you're going to be playing them into uh, the opponent's minions, it's uh, likely that they're then in return going to receive a buff and kill your Saradine Chain again. So um, pretty dependent on how how well your deck curves out. In a, in a deck that curves out well. Putting two extra minions on the board can be the difference between your opponent being able to deal with, uh, you know, your entire board or only a fraction of it. Mm. The next card, I wasn't really going to review this, but I think it's fair. It's fair to mention it. It's the Keening Banshee. Now, there's there's a couple phases I feel you have as a player when you look at this. The first phase is you look at this card and say, "Ew, removing cards from the top of my deck." unplayable then you go like wait fell reaver was really good and that milled my deck and then you see that um in in this meta there's there's a lot of uh stopping power a lot of stall right so it's not necessarily that you're going to um lose the game because they stall but it does give you kind of a loss condition it's a, definitely a card i'm gonna experiment with for now, it feels like I will try it out because board control is going to be so important and a 4 and a 5-5 may just be enough to tip the scales. But with all the uh, taunt effects coming in and especially some of the more powerful effects later on, it feels like the uh, downside is not going to be worth the upside. But I did want to mention the card because, um, you know, like Fal Reaver was really good. Obviously, this one isn't as, as well stat as Fal Reaver. But the downside for you is controllable. And you're, you know, you're not suddenly going to play four cards in one turn and, and mill your entire deck. All right. Whew. Next up, the Corpse Razor. So very comparable, right, to the um, the Dead Speaker. Dead Speaker, three mana, two, four, make your minion immune. That's essentially what this card is going to do when you trade it off immediately. The upside is that you can play this card without having to trade your minion off immediately or you can play it trade into a minion and leave your minion at a lower health and then once it dies it'll then still respawn so even though i don't think it's as good right as the uh that speaker it's still going to be relevant and once a deck is properly uh curving right i i think this will be a nice addition Oof. All right, I'm going to take a sip of water before the next one, because... Oh my god. All right, guys, Bone Drake. Now, at first glance, you look at this card and you say, Wow, that's pretty good. And then you realize, Ysera is a dragon. Deathwing is a dragon. Primordial Drake is a dragon, right? 
there, there's a lot of crazy Drakes um, for all kinds of situations. Um, Alex Straza suddenly healing your opponent out of nowhere. Um, Nosdormu, right, just putting down an 8-8. So not only is this card going to give you a lot of value a lot of the time, it's also going to be frustrating because you're going to lose games to this card even though you weren't really supposed to lose just because your opponent high rolled the Bone Drake Death Rattle. Um, and, you know, of course there is the Bone Drake into Bone Drake into Bone Drake it's the meme that can happen as well. But overall, um, I think it's a very uh, poorly designed card, at least from an arena standpoint, because it's, it's one of these cards that is not heavily penalized stat-wise. It's a 6 mana 6-5 six that is absolutely playable. It's not great, but it is playable. And its effect can is always going to be positive, right? You're never going to be like, oh man, I really hate getting this fairy dragon in my hand right now. Um, right? You're not going to do that. But it can also just be like, oh, Deathwing, cool. I can win the game now. It's, yeah. It's not just Deathwing, right? Getting a Sarah out of nowhere is great. Getting a Primordial Drake out of nowhere is great. Um, I think the Cobalt, right? The Cobalt Scale. Uh, Cobalt Scale Bin is also a dragon. Just getting a free 5-5 five five with, with upside. So yeah, um, not very happy about this card. I, I think it's going to be almost an auto pick for, for most people. Uh, especially, you know, if, if, you're, if you're a priest, for instance, and you have some dragon synergy going already. But just in general, it's just, you know, it's a card with very little weaknesses and it can just straight up win you the game. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's not really healthy for the arena. But well, um, we will see where it goes, of course, guys. Uh, we don't, I don't want to get too negative. I think overall, um, the trend they're taking with this set rewards drafting for a curve and thinking ahead and planning, right? So I think it will still be a better experience than getting Primordial Drake out of nowhere <laughs> and losing the game because of that, even though you were on the board. All right, that was it for the rares, guys. Let's get to the epics. So for the epics, I've got a uh, Corpse Taker. I wanted to dismiss this card fairly early on, but then I realized, hey, in Paladin, it's actually pretty likely you're going to get a Divine Shield. And from there on, there's actually quite a bit of upside. So if you do have Divine Shield in your deck already, I think Corpse Taker is a good addition because then you're talking a Silver Moon Guardian that can just get better, right? If you have a four mana, three, three, Taunt the Vine Shield, that's a pretty good minion. Now, you know, give it, I think it's very rare to get a Windfear minion in your deck, but maybe a Stormwatcher. Uh, but most of the time, you know, you, you draft it because you have the Vine Shield in your deck. Uh, and I don't think you draft it super highly, but it is mentionable, right? Cool. The Rattling Rascal. So I looked at this card at first glance, I was like, I don't really know what to make of it. You get a 5-5, five five, you get a 5-5, five five, everybody gets a 5-5, five five, right? But then, it, then I realized that all that matters is the initiative. So when you get this huge explosion of stats on the board, you're playing a 4 mana 2-2 two two plus a 5-5 five five without overloads, right? Whereas a normal Shaman meme is 4 mana 7-7, seven seven, right? But you pay the price next round. This thing, um, so first of all, if they can't snipe the 2-2 immediately, it's pretty darn good, right? Because you get an additional turn where you get to work with a 5-5 and your opponent doesn't. If they do get to snipe the 2-2 immediately, they probably can't kill your 5-5. It's your turn. You play your Death Speaker, you make your 5-5 immune, kill their 5-5. And the Rattling Rascal was pretty darn good for you then. So I think looking at this card through the lens of how we see the game right now, you look at this and say that's not that good, right? Because you you know get a five five, but your opponent gets a five five. But then you realize, wait, whoever attacks first gets a huge advantage in this expansion. And then suddenly I'm like, okay, I, I definitely need to give this card a try and play around with it and see how it goes. Uh, I might still be wrong, but from how I feel the game is gonna uh, you know go right now, um, this this could be very good on curve, absolutely. Because we're just talking the scenario where they have the snipe, right? They have something on the board to kill the 2-2. They, they have a, a spell to kill it. 
where they don't have it, it's it's really oppressive, right? You get a five five and a two two. You can you can really work with that. All right, guys. Uh, for the epics, there weren't that many that I was really impressed with. I'll quickly mention Tomb Lurker, um, just because you can compare it to a um, Lotus Agents. A Lotus Agents is just better. A Lotus Agents is also kind of class bound. So this is one of those cards that. You're not really going to draft highly, but it'll do, right? If you have some death rattles in your deck, you're like, eh, okay, it'll do. It's fine. I'm not going to draft it very highly, but sometimes it'll find a way in the deck. Then the Rubian Unraveler, six mana, five, five spells cost two more. I'm not too impressed by it right now. I might be wrong. It depends, right? Uh, we'll have to see how. I think obviously against Mage, it'll do well because Mage is very spell dependent and it could delay the Paladin Spike Rich Steed. But it feels like a lot of the um, cards right now really they're they're minions right the minions are really the the, the cards that that screw you over you know we're talking um, the bone mare the dead speaker the um, the valkyrie the plus two health so it feels like when you pay six mana for a five five that is under status and it doesn't really do anything for the board that feels a little risky because it may mean that you fall behind on the board and then because of that, you um, you lose board control, and that is that is just deadly in this expansion. Now, it, it might be a nice addition to a board that is already ahead, and then you put the Unraveler down and say, okay, you're really not coming back right now because I've accumulated this board lead, and now you know even your comeback spells are going to cost more, so it's going to be harder for you to get back in there, right? Like Flame Strike is going to cost nine mana, so that's you know that's not going to save you anymore. So once again, a card I'll, I'll need to play around with, but I feel like it's only gonna make sense in decks that um, curve out well and consistently get ahead on the board. All right, so for the legendaries, I don't really want to go over the, the Prince cards because I, you know, I don't think they're very relevant for Arena. Um, a bit surprising, I'll quickly touch on Arthas, right? May may look like a bit of a meme card. Uh, whereas, I mean, you'll, you'll play it, right? But it's a legendary. And it's not like it's like super, super crazy powerful, but it's a beast. Now, what does that mean? You can get it out of Infest. You can get it out of Jewel Macaw, right? That's, that's two big ones. There's probably another way to get a random beast, uh, Stampede, right? So every time a hunter gets this um, and he high rolls the, the Death Rattle, um, uh, the Death Knight card, I'll quickly go over them, right? So you can, if you haven't if you haven't seen the Death Knight cards, we'll just put them on the side here so you can pause the video and read them. But I'll just give you a scenario where um, a hunter uh, gets Arthas from a jeweled macaw, then uh, plays the Arthas. Let's say turn six or so, Arthas dies. The hunter gets Frostmourne. Suddenly, that's a pretty good jeweled macaw, right? <laughs> that's a pretty good jeweled macaw. And that's going to happen, right? That is going to happen, because we know that legendaries don't get a penalty when it comes to these random discoveries. It's not like in the draft where you go like, oh, you know, you rarely get a legendary out of a Jewel Macaw. It's like, no, I mean, you get, a, you get a legendary as often as you would get a common when it comes to these things. So, yeah, that's why I think it's worth mentioning. Uh, you, will, you will see that in Arena, and it won't always screw you over, but it'll definitely sometimes screw you over. All right, and then we save the best for last. Oh my god, I cannot believe they did this! Why, Blizzard, why? All right. So, the Lich King, an 8 mana 8-8. Eight, eight. Taunt. We're going to touch on that in a little bit. At the end of your turn, add a random Death Knight card to your hand. Right, once again, we'll put the, uh, we'll have the Death Knight cards here on the side so you can see. There's a lot of good cards in there, right? There's definitely also cards that can win the board back for you. And it's an 8-8 taunt, so it's not like you can exactly go face and uh, ignore it and, and kill off the player. Which seems to be a recurring theme they, they have right now uh, in, you know, first Primordial Drake. Uh, having a really powerful effect, but also taunt, so you can't ignore it and go face and win the game that way. You first have to deal with it. Same here with the Lich King. Um, if, if, you, if you hit death and decay and that's all you needed to stabilize on the board your lich king now survives that's that's crazy right that it the uh the way i explain it is it's like um 
Ironbark Protector and Ysera, <laughs> you know, they, they got a baby and boom, here's the Lich King, right? An 8-8 eight, eight taunt with a Ysera effect and some pretty darn powerful Ysera cards, right? Now, why is the taunt even more annoying? It's our good friend Stonehill Defender. It's the reason that, you know, the, the amount of Terrans and Tyrians in Arena have uh, increased by, I, I don't know what number, but a, a crazy amount, right? So, yeah, this is going to be super frustrating. Your opponent's going to play Stonehill Defender, and then turn 8, the Lich King comes down, he gets a high roll, and then he proceeds to, he proceeds to win the game from that just because he had um, a neutral 3-mana taunt minion. That's, you know, that's, that's pretty frustrating, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have a problem with it if it was just this really powerful legendary standalone, you know, no taunt. But the fact that it can be um, pulled from a discover um, the same way it can be pulled from free from amber. So Priest as well is going to have uh, a pretty significant advantage when it comes to the amount of Lich Kings they can play because it can be discovered from free from amber. Yeah, it's just... It's just not good, I feel. It's not good for the arena. I get that they have to make the Lich King some really epic badass dude, but yeah, I mean, you're going to lose games to this, right? It's going to happen and it's going to feel really bad. You're also going to win games where you'll be like, ah, oh, play Stone Hill, oh my god, oh my god, I got Lich King, oh, but, you know, or a priest who like, man, really could use a Lich King right about now, and then you Amber a Lich King. Just think about how many times you Amber a Yasera and then make it so that they can't ignore the Ysera, they have to kill it first, but you will get a card anyway. Alright, All right, well, that was it for the neutrals, guys. Um, some really powerful cards in there, but definitely a theme, right? Uh, get a held on the board, snowball, and then use that lead to just crush your opponent. I'll now go over the class cards. I will not be talking about the Death Knights, uh, because you know, they're, they're legendaries and you shouldn't really be seeing them as much anyways. I won't be talking about any of the legendaries, seeing as they're not as relevant when it comes to Arena. Other than the cards you can reliably get, like for instance Lich King out of Amber, or you know, Arthas out of a out of Beast Discover, or a random beast. Alright, let's start with the uh, Warrior. Not, a, not really a lot of cards that are uh, uh, relevant for Warrior Disc Expansion when it comes to Arena. It seems that a lot of the cards were more uh, tailored towards Constructed. But we definitely have one really good one, the uh, Mountain Fire Armor. A 3 mana 4-3, well statted, and if it dies on your opponent's turn you gain 6 armor. So whenever you have a minion that is well statted and it has a purely positive effect, that makes for a really good card. So definitely Mount of Fire Amber, uh, like I said, it was reminiscent of Fierce Monkey, not quite as strong, 3-mana, three, 3-4 three three, with Taunt is still quite a bit better, uh, but you know, it's getting there, it's getting there. Then, uh, Valkyr Soul Claimer, I wasn't 100% sure what to make of this card, but seeing as it's, it's going to be so important that you stay on the board, stay relevant, have something to buff, the Valkyr is going to make it harder to... Uh, completely clear your board and then if you have some of the strong neutral buff minions uh, it's going to be harder to completely wipe the board and it's going to be easier for you to get at least you know a 2-2 out to buff or you end up buffing the Valkyrie Soul Claimer which can then obviously be problematic for your opponent where you give it extra health it survives it tanks two hits you get two extra ghouls out of it so I don't think it's going to be a crazy card but it's definitely something I'm going to be playing around with seeing how it plays out uh, and then we have Blood Razor, and I believe that's going to be no, no after Blood Razor. There's also Forge of Souls, but Blood Ra uh, Blood Razor. It's not as good as Dead Spite, at least not in my opinion. Dead Spite had the um, very useful uh, execution that you could kill a turn three with it. You coin it out, and then kill a turn four, and oftentimes you could also kill a turn four with it, right? If it was only four health, and then deal five damage to the turn five. So that's very, very powerful in one card. If, if your weapon can kill two curve plays from the opponent, that's very strong. True Silver is not quite as strong, but we, know, we all know how good True Silver is. Well, that's why it's just a better True Silver. So in that regard, I don't make Blood Razor a better, you know, 
um, or as good as, as Dead Spite. Is this still a good card though? And I believe it is, right? Um, pinging minions, uh, especially as a warrior, is pretty darn useful because your hero power can't do it. And then you can deal an additional two to something, and then the turn after you can once again AoE. Uh, like I said, I think the card was a bit overhyped, right? Because it's still four mana to deal two damage twice as, as a weapon that's not as impressive. But then, of course, you get the uh, battle cry and the death rattle added on to that. So absolutely uh, decent in the arena, but like I said, I don't think it's going to be uh, super crazy. Then, Forge of Souls, two mana, draw two weapons from your deck. I wasn't really sure where to rate this, but then I figured a lot of the time in arena, if you get um, an excess of weapons, you can just start to go face, which is going to be less likely now because <laughs> Your opponent's gonna punish you really hard to go face but at least if you have your weapons there's a higher chance you can clear so I don't think Forge of Souls is going to be good but it's one of those things that you you pick up if you um, it's just because you're a warrior right you don't want to be hero powering anyway it's really important that you can spend your mana properly um, that's why I think Forge of Souls still uh, deserves a mention um, once again, it's something I will definitely try out, and this is one of those cards where I feel you need to you need to test it, and I feel like it's either going to be uh, decent or not so good. I don't think it's going to be an amazing card. All right, that was it for the warrior. Moving on to warlock, and yeah, there's definitely a couple cards in here where I'd be like, what is this, right? Cool. So we'll start out pretty pretty tame, right? Drain soul, two mana deal two and heal your hero for two, right? Lifesteal for two. Normally when you compare this card, you're like, oh, two mana to deal two, that's not so good, right? Frostbolt, right? Frostbolt deals three. You got, excuse me, you got your Dark Bomb from back in the day that also deals three. But we're talking Warlock here. And Warlock cards need to be slightly worse than the average card because you can draw two of them, right? So in Warlock, I, I think Drain Soul is absolutely okay. Drain Life is a card you would occasionally draft, and that three mana, obviously quite a bit worse than Drain Soul. Drain Soul is just, you know, a better Drain Life. Doesn't go face though, important, only goes to minions. But still, right, it seems playable, and because you're Warlock, and because clearing the board is so important, I still think the card will see, see some play. Then Defile, wow. <laughs> um, I don't think the card inherently, you know, is always gonna be OP, but it's just always it's going to be in the back of your mind, right? You're going to have to figure out where exactly you can uh, play minions, yes or no, for the file not to be a full clear. So if you have a one health minion, a two health minion, a three health minion, a four health minion, etc., etc., and your opponent plays the file, deal one damage. The one health minions die. Uh, then the file gets cast again. Your two health minion now is a one health minion. It dies. The file gets cast again. Your three health minion is now a one health minion. It's going to die. On top of that, your opponent can manipulate that board state on his own to add something. Um, for instance, a possessed villager. Suddenly you're guaranteed two triggers. So if your opponent has a uh, three health minion and a four health minion and you play possessed villager and then play the file, the file will go off, kill your possessed villager, plays again, kills your uh, shadow beast, I believe it is, triggers again. The three health minion is now at one. The foul goes off again. The three health minion dies. The four health minion is now at one. The foul goes off again. So you can see how um, out of nowhere this this seemingly uh, cheap card can just wipe an entire board. Now it is quite conditional. I do get that, but still, I think this is uh, this is going to be uh, relevant. Uh, absolutely, a card I'll be drafting and I'll be testing it, and uh, something I'll keep in the back of my mind when I'm playing against warlocks. Now, the next card, when I read it, I was like, whoa, whoa, no way, right? It's the Despicable Dreadlord. It's just a really good card, right? And I, I haven't really seen many people uh, go off about it, uh, probably because it's a Warlock card, but as it's a demon, so that's, that's an upside, it has demon tech, uh, a 5 mana 4-5 is not good, but playable right the body as long as the effect is good and oh man is the effect good 
It just pings one damage to all enemy minions. That's that's crazy, right? So it's a it's a five mana four or five with an arcane explosion attached. But if you don't kill it next turn, it just gets another arcane explosion, and it just keeps going on. So in, in a way, it's maybe a, a mini Baron Geddon, but it doesn't hit your own board, nor your face, right? So yeah, uh, wow. Uh, I'm absolutely going to be trying out Warlock because this card seems seems super strong. And then you know you can even combo it with a defile where you can defile and perhaps get one damage off from clearing, and then you just play the Dead Lord, and then the Dead Lord uh, or the Dread Lord rather uh, takes it from there. Uh, yeah, pretty pretty strong card. Alright, um, I will be reviewing Gnome Feratu very briefly, very briefly uh, just because I think mo a lot of people might think it's better than it is. It's a 2 mana 3 2, which is actually fine, super fine, but milling the top card of your opponent's deck doesn't actually do anything unless they're gonna go into fatigue. You might say, but Shady, what if the top card was something really good? Then, you know, you just pretend like that was at the bottom of the deck. And he wasn't going to draw that anyway, right? That's just being really results oriented. And I think more often than not, you're going to mill uh, a crappy card, and then they're going to have a chance to draw their good card more. Once again, that's just being results oriented. Uh, TLDR, milling a card from the top of the deck doesn't really matter unless you're actually fatiguing them, right? But still, as a 2 mana 2 3, totally playable card. Okie dokie, moving on to Shaman. First up, uh, a two drop, right? Not something we've seen a lot. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the classes don't really have a reliable two drop. And uh, at a two minute two two, the burlock, amazing name, uh, the burlock doesn't really impress, but it can freeze an enemy. And when you freeze an enemy, there's a higher chance you're going to get initiative. And if you're going to get initiative, guess what? That's pretty damn. That's pretty damn good in this set because there's all these buff effects that reward you for being in control of the board. So just the ability to freeze something and not take a huge stat penalty, it allows you to uh, kind of shape the board the way you want to, and it's going to make it more likely you get ahead and you utilize your buffs. All right. Next up, Drakari Defender. I wasn't really sure what to make of this card because I was like. Damn, man, you're really pushing the envelope here. Three mana, two, eight, taunt. So is this thing going to live? Yes. Are you going to cast something the turn after? No. <laughs> so we're going to have to see how, how much that offsets, right? Um, at two damage, it's not really going to kill uh, your opponent's turn three. But it's definitely this is going to be, it's going to feel fairly demotivating when your opponent plays a Bloodfen Raptor and you um, coin this thing into the Bloodfen Raptor. <laughs> that's, that's pretty strong, right? Um, then you skip your turn three, that's fine because you've killed their Bloodfen Raptor and you now have a two and five. So just imagine that your turn three was I play a two and five taunt because that's essentially what happens, right? Your, your turn two traded with his turn two, you now have a two five and then your turn three was a two five. So not only have you gained a card on your opponent, you've also played a totally reasonably statted minion, which then is ready to get buffed by, say, a, uh, a Fall Sun Cleric, giving it an additional plus one, plus one. Uh, whenever you have these really high health minions gaining any kind of damage, that makes it super relevant. Uh, imagine tucking a uh, Cobalt, let me make sure I get the name, the name correct, right? a cobalt scale bane right you get a cobalt scale bane next to this thing uh, that's pretty scary right if you can't kill it immediately that's going to accumulate damage very fast so not 100 percent sure if it's going to be as good as i think it is but it's going to warrant testing for sure and i think automatically in some decks this card is going to hit pretty hard it might be that your deck isn't really tailored for it but in some decks, I think absolutely this, this, this card will be a nice heavy hitter. All right, uh, Avalanche, the next card I want to talk about. Positioning, yes, yes. All right, some more positioning things. I always, I always love it when positioning gets rewarded. And I love it when we can punish opponents for not positioning 
properly. Uh, free the minion in the center, deal three damage to the adjacent ones. So when this gets full value, it's pretty darn strong. However, if opponents learn how to position against it, most of the time you're going to hit a totem or hit a 1-1 one, one for three damage and then the target, uh, the target you, you want it. Because uh, you'll, um, you'll probably need to reposition it where you don't really freeze the center but freeze the side to be able to deal three damage on the minion you want dead. So against the shaman, make sure to put your, um, your three health minions more towards the center and especially don't put you know a weak minion in the middle and two uh three health minions or whatever the cards you don't want to get hit on the edges the way how you would like play against a rogue on autopilot versus betrayal you want to do kind of the reverse uh versus a shaman uh now when you get stronger minions the 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 middle gets frozen so then you, you don't want to you don't want to put your six drop in the middle either so this card is going to be really interesting to play around and play with uh, I think, I think it's fun to uh, add another bit of positioning to the arena. Alright, Voodoo Hexer is up next. At a 5 mana 2 7, the stats aren't really overwhelming, but it has Taunt, that's a pretty big one, and it will freeze anything damaged by it. That is a huge, huge um, uh, slow, like uh, the, the pace slows down a lot when this card is being played. Now, like I said, the way how the way how I think the game's gonna go is even if this card comes down against you and you have a bunch of buffs, I don't think it'll matter too much, but it's at least going to give your opponent a chance to counter buff because even if you kill this card in one go, um, say in one turn, you're gonna have two, maybe even three minions frozen, uh, probably two, and then maybe the third one died or so, and then your opponent gets to develop. You can't counter trade it. And then he, for instance, gets to Bone Mare first. So still want to name this card because anytime you freeze a minion, uh, taunt your opponent out, it makes it less likely they clear your board. And as we said, there are huge, huge rewards for having cards on the board this expansion. Cool. Cryostasis is another one. Uh, at first glance, this card looks pretty darn bad. Give a minion plus three plus three and freeze it. But then you go like, huh, I can put this on a Drakari Defender, and I don't really care if it's frozen. So then you do the math, you're like, whoa, that is a 511 taunt. That's pretty good, right? Especially if you play it on turn three, then turn four, you coin out a cryostasis. Turn four, you have a 511 taunt. And remember, from what we've seen, there is very, very little reliable removal in this set. Um, this is nowhere near Angoro, where we have cards like Valspine, Gastropod, uh, Giant Wasp, or Meteor, Venom Weapon, right? All those cards are going to be seeing less, so just creating a giant dude is going to be a lot safer than it is in you know, the current environment, the Angoro environment. So it'll probably be deck dependent. But in the right decks, I think Cryostasis will have its uh, will have its place. Uh, now, something that was brought to me brought to my attention during my stream is that what freeze means is your opponent is is your minion, the minion that gets frozen, skips its next attack. So if your minion is eligible to attack, but you choose not to and Cryostasis it, next turn it'll actually unfreeze and you'll be able to swing with it. So uh, definitely don't make the mistake to go face with the minion, then cryostasis it, you'd much rather hold, cryostasis it, and then the turn after attack with your bigger minion. Right? So just a little tip should you find yourself in that position. Then Snow Fury Giant I think speaks for itself. Um, not very good unless you're in a deck where you have a lot of overload. Uh, if you play through two Drakari defenders, you've overloaded for six, Snow Fury Giant is a five mana eight eight. Now, it's not going to come down on turn five if you already played two defenders because it's heavily going to disrupt your curve. But you can see what I mean. Uh, I think this is a card where you use your own, your own sense of what, um, what is good, what is bad. And unless you have a significant amount of overload, I, I'd probably uh, stay away from the card. Okay, that was it for the Shaman. Moving on to Rogue. 
First card here is the Plague Scientist. Three mana, two, three. Underwhelming in stats. And the combo ability gives a minion poisonous. So once again, you get rewarded for board control, but it takes a while, right? Comboing a three mana minion. Now you might say, hey, Shady, SI Agent is a three mana combo minion, and that card's pretty good and it sees a lot of play. Well, that's because like turn two, you can coin an SI, or you can, let's say maybe even turn four, uh, play a one mana card and then play SI. That's different than with the Plague Scientist. With the Plague Scientist, ideally you want to have a minion on the board that's already able to attack, so that's already a condition, and then you need to combo it, put the Plague Scientist down, and then sacrifice that minion. So is this a bad card? No, but is it is it like a, a crazy meta-defining card? Also not really, because you're, you're already going to be in the habit of clearing your opponent's board, and then Rogue has a conditional buff your guy to kill the opponent's guy. I don't think that's too crazy. It's still something worth mentioning, of course, but I remember when this card was first released, people were saying, oh my god, this is so strong, this is crazy. Um, like I don't think it's as good as it was hyped up to be. Next up, Bone Baron, 5 out of 5, 5, passes the vanilla stat test, that's pretty good. And then it has a useful effect to add two 1-1 one -one skeletons to your hand, useful, for instance, to combo with the uh, Plague Scientist, so you can play a 1-1 one -one card and then your Scientist, or whichever combo card of the Rogue, or you just have two 1-1s one -ones for free. Enjoy. <laughs> Shadow Blades, the next one. Um, reminds of Deadly Poison, but you have the upside that the first attack you make, you're not going to take any recoil. The downside is that it's less flexible than Deadly Poison. So I would still prefer to have a Deadly Poison in my deck, but this one will do, right? So I think that's a good way of describing it. It'll do, but I'd rather have Deadly Poison. But Deadly Poison is just a good card, right? All right, Runeforge Haunter works well with the Shadow Blade. Um, you can attack and you will not lose a durability on your weapon. So this is obviously dependent on how many weapon buffs you are have in the deck and also probably how many of them come down on turn three, like Shadow Blade, like Deadly Poison. I don't think it's a, um, a great card, but it's something that we'll see play and you'll see it in uh, a decent amount of rogue decks, just, you know, the expansion bonus is on there. At three health on turn four, it's a bit more likely that, you know, your opponent can clean it up. And as we said, board control is really relevant. So like I said, I think it'll see play, but I don't think it's a great card. All right, Doomerang. I wanted to mention this card because to be honest, I'm, I'm not 100% certain on this card, right, how well it will do. It doesn't feel too strong because you go over it and go like, wow, this is crazy. One mana, deal the damage of the weapon, but it goes to your hand afterwards. So unless you have two weapon charges left on a relevant weapon, say an Envenom weapon, which rarely happens because you usually attack with it straight away, so it'd have to be in the turn where you play Envenom weapon, and then your opponent would have to have two minions on the board. It's not that great. It works well if you've just played a Shadow Blade, and then turn four, you Doomerang something, deal three to it, equip another Shadow Blade and attack again, but then your opponent needs to have two good targets for uh, the three damage, and you need to draw them together. Uh, so obviously a horrendous draw late in the game when you're top decking, because essentially it'll deal one mana deal one without you taking recoil, which basically your hero power will do, but with the recoil. So I don't think it's as great, but if your deck is very synergistic for it, then I'll definitely give it a try. Right. All right, that's it for the rogues. Moving on to priest. All right. First up, shadow ascendant. Seems pretty good, right? And once again, a two drop. Very important. Shaman got a 2-drop, Warlock got a 2-drop, but it's epic. And now Priest gets a 2-drop. So I feel like those classes are inherently go are going to have the advantage, because as I mentioned, curving out is going to be very important. And if you have a play on turn 2 and your opponent doesn't, that is a huge advantage, because snowballing is going to be such a big thing. On top of that, even though it's a 2-mana two 2-2, two -two, its effect is really relevant, as, we, as we've already mentioned, snowballing. So 
if you happen to have a one into two as a priest, your one drop suddenly gets upgraded to a two drop, and then you have Shadow Ascendant next there with more upside. Turn three, you play a, um, God, I always forget the name. I think it's Death, Death Speaker, right? Double checking, yes, Death Speaker. Turn three, you play a Death Speaker. Wow, that's, that's, that's kind of game over, right? It, in, a, in a meta where snowballing is gonna be super important. So yeah, I, I, can, I can absolutely see Priest benefiting quite a bit from the fact that it has a class too, and not very many other classes have it. All right, next up, Acolyte of Agony. Nothing too crazy, but it's a class three, so more chance once again to curve out. And at three mana, three, three, it's not terrible. So, you know, just putting it out there as in you'll see it quite a bit because it's a class card. And then, you know, it just helps, it helps you curve out. Eternal Servitude, um, at first glance, seems pretty good, but I don't think you want to have too many copies of this card in your deck because it is conditional, right? It's not something you can just play on turn four every time and be happy about it. It's more, I, I think it's gonna be doing pretty well as a one-off. You have one of these cards in your deck, turn six, you know, you've just traded off your five drop, you play this thing, you get your five drop back, you use a hero power, you play a two drop, and obviously, you know, the later in the game you play it, the more ridiculous it can get. Um, I think it's I think it's gonna be a decent one-off in a deck. I don't think you want to have too many of these cards. The same way as, um, I, I like to think of this card as a better Molten Reflection, and Molten Reflection can get really clunky, but of course this one doesn't require the minion to survive, you can just resummon it. Cool, next up, Devour Mind. Um, big Thought Steal, let's just call it a Big Thought Steal, because that's what it is. I don't think it's going to be that great, right, because we're going to be working on curving out and snowballing from there, but in a deck where you have drafted lots of early game, the Devourer Mind can then allow you to stay in the game, stay relevant. Uh, it's also comparable to Kabbalist Tome in a way, where you sacrifice five mana and get three cards. So depending on the archetype of your deck, I think the card can absolutely see play. Um, if, you, if you are either a fast deck and require a refuel, or you have sufficient tools to hold off the board, which I don't think you'll get too many of in this in this expansion, seeing as if you're not on the board, things are gonna go south really fast, right? You're gonna need to be really on point with uh, AoE and Potion of Madness, etc. So I think it's gonna be very, um, it's gonna be a lot more difficult as a priest to just kind of be like, ah, let's just see what they throw at me. Because they're gonna be throwing a lot of stuff at you and very fast and very snowballing. Um, so I'm not really convinced that you can do the sit back, relax priest. I think you're gonna have to try and curve out like like most classes right now uh, to utilize the strong uh, neutral cards. Cool. Uh, next up, embrace darkness. This is one of those cards that could allow allow you to sit back and relax because if your opponent is a priest and you have an empty board to play on. Do you play your Bullifist into their turn six? Yeah, feels a bit weird with this card, right? Because if your opponent has cards on their board and you play your minion and they play Embrace Darkness, they've played six mana and you can use your card to trade into their cards. You damage your card, right, on one end and you um, kill off their card. That's kind of okay if you then give them the, the minion. But if this card hits on an empty board, that's not really okay. That is a six mana mind control for almost all intents and purposes. So yeah, something to be mindful of. Can I just drop this big minion into his turn six? The answer is probably not right now. Cool, uh, it's time for some old bullshit. Yay, bullshit. <laughs> uh, Obsidian statue, hello. So, uh, Stonehill Defender and Free From Amber, anyone? I think we've seen this. I think this is a recurring thing with very strong taunt minions. Uh, bad Blizzard, bad Blizzard, stop printing strong taunt minions. Uh, ah, whatever. So, when you play this for, for 9 mana, it might feel like you're paying a ton for a 4 8 body, but taunt, lifesteal. If you are a more control oriented deck and you do make it into the late game, and your opponent is all about tempo, it can be very frustrating. Sorry. 
it can be very frustrating to have this card trade into probably a minimum of two of your minions, heal the opponent's face for eight, and then take one of your minions with it. Um, and that's only like if you've traded and both minions survived. A lot of the time you need to trade where one minion dies and one minion survives, and then the surviving minion gets taken down as well with the Obsidian Statue. Now there's definitely gonna be board states where the card doesn't hit as hard, or you get to sap it, or you get to silence it, and then you just win the game because your opponent spent nine mana. But when you don't have those tools available, and keep in mind, from what we've seen, there is very, very little, if no removal, printed. It's all about using your board to trade. And a card like this thrives when your opponent needs the board to trade. You're gonna heal for a lot, and you're gonna take something with, uh, with it. Especially when you pull it off an Amber, especially when you get it for free. Uh, well, not for free, but you get it from a Stone Hill. Um, yeah, I think, you know, another card that can uh, potentially prevent you from winning a game which feels like you should have won it. It all depends on their follow-up afterwards, of course. But if they play an Obsidian Statue and then they get another Taunt Down and then they get a good Mind Control, that's a game where you felt like, ah, oh, I kind of can't lose into, holy shit, he's pulling it off. All right, moving on to Paladin. Paladin is one of the few classes that gets a nice one drop. I think the Warlock got a one, but that's not really one you want to play on one. And uh, Warrior also has a one, but also not really a one you want to play on one. So yeah, uh, here is the Righteous Protector. Now you might say, yeah, this card is good, but is it really going to matter that much? So it's a one mana Argent Squire with Taunt. So not only is it good on curve, it can be very influential later in the game to block your opponent from making a trade they want and then you get to keep your minion, you get to buff your minion and do, 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 do. you know like the circus music starts playing and the paladin goes off. Uh, especially with all the benefits there are to curving out, I think the uh, Righteous Protector is going to be quite the pickup. Uh, so I think we're still going to be seeing quite a bit of paladin being played in the next expansion. Dark Conviction, pretty good turn two on your Righteous Protector. Uh, turn a minion into a 3-3. Now, this is not only good to throw on your own recruits and your own, uh, you know, like 1-1 uh, Divine Shield minions, for instance. It's, it's also decent to uh, nerf one of your opponent's bigger minions, right? Um, turning your opponent's Obsidian Statue in a 3-3 makes it far more manageable than the 4-8 the taunt it is. Uh, same with the Lich King, for instance. So we've seen this effect in Keeper of Older Man, and it was one of the most uh, toxic experiences I've had in the meta, because that's kind of the whole thing versus Paladin, is you develop a bigger minion onto their empty board. That used to be your, your safe haven, right? You used to do that, and it was virtually nothing they could really do about it. Maybe an Equality, maybe an Alder. But now there's a common card that can just turn your big guy into a 3-3. Now I, I know it's not attached to a body, it's nowhere near as good as Keeper of Uldermann. But still, I think this card is going to see some play. And especially in decks that curve out well, being able to use this for tempo to stay relevant on the board. Either buff their little guy, get a little bit of extra speed, or nerf your mid-range card, get a good trade. Um, I think it's still going to be a frustrating card to play against. So, And it's a common, and it's a spell, so it's pretty much going to be everywhere. All right, uh, next up, I'll mention the Howling Commander, but only in case you have, you know, obviously in case you have Divine Shield minions in your deck. Otherwise, I, th I think this card speaks for itself, right? Draft if Divine, minions, if, if Divine Shield minions, if not, stay away from it. Arrogant Crusader, next one. Um, first glance, I was like, eh, two health, you know, we've seen this before. But then you have this thing, hey, your opponent doesn't actually want to kill it. And hey, if they don't kill it, I have something on the board. And hey, if I have something on the board, good things are going to happen, right? Uh, not only with the expansion-specific cards, but Spike Rich Deed, Blessing of Kings, Argent Protector, Crime Street Protector, right? All these cards have some really nice benefits when you are ahead on the when you have a minion with initiative as a paladin specifically so 
I will absolutely be trying this card out. I think you're just gonna have to feel it, see how good it is. But for now, it feels like it's gonna be an acceptable turn four. All right, uh, I've got black card on my list as well. While at first you might look at it as like really shady, you know, how often is that gonna happen where you heal your hero and it then deals damage? It can definitely happen, right? With True Silver. True Silver now pings for two damage if you have this card on the board. Uh, if you have any kind of lifesteal minion that's attacking, um, the Guardian of Kings, right? But more than that, uh, the, more, the, the reason why I actually have it on my list is because it has nine health. Once again, if a minion has a lot of health, it's going to be hard to get rid of it. And you, you, can, you can really see this recurring theme, right? If it's hard to get rid of a minion, then your opponent's probably going to get to keep it, then he's going to get to buff it. And, you know, turn six black card, turn seven bone mare, that is a fat, fat taunt minion ready to protect you and to make sure your opponent never gets to see your face again. So yeah, that's why it's on my list. Nine health for six mana. I don't think that's anything we've just seen before, right? It's just very resilient, very likely to stick around. All right, then we are uh, almost there, right? We got Mage Hunter Druid left. Uh, Mage here, we got Breath of Sindragosa. Playable, I don't think it's crazy good, right? Uh, because it is random. Bit reminiscent of Flame Cannon, but obviously only, only two damage instead of four, right? Which was obviously the big reason Flame Cannon was really strong. But it's going to be good enough that it's going to see play. Uh, so prepare to get your, your stuff frozen. <laughs> All right, uh, next up, I got Cold Wraith. Really, really good, right? We talked about how important board control is. Uh, three fours are very good at getting you ahead on the board because the expected uh, stat line for your opponent to play is usually a 3-3. Three, three. Now, obviously, there are some good four threes out there, uh, but let, let's, put it, let's put it like this. It's very rare that you're going to play a 3-4 and then you're going to lose board as a result of that. Uh, whereas it's going to be way more likely that you're going to play 3-4 and you're going to gain a lead on the board because of it. And then it has upsides. Sometimes, you know, you Breath of Sindragosa, play your Cold Wraith, draw a card. Pretty, pretty darn good. All right. Then we got Ice Walker. Not necessarily a card that's powerful in the early game, right? Uh, we can compare it to a Mana Wraith in terms of stats. 2 mana, 1, 3. Um, but later in the game, this card could be pretty darn annoying where Let's say your opponent does have a big minion ready to hit your face. You can play Ice Walker, freeze it, play some other stuff. Next turn, ping it again, freeze it. Uh, and we know that if mages get to kind of stall the board, set it up, get a good meteor, get a good flame strike, this can be really frustrating because against the mage, you're usually on the clock as you want to kill them as fast as possible because they just naturally get to get more cards than you because of you know how good their spells are, good the hero power is. Um, so yeah, I think not very good in the early game, but can be deceptively decent in the late game at keeping you alive. Ghastly Conjure, another one of those cards that's good at keeping you alive. Uh, at a 4 mana 2-6, it's not really that impressive, the stats, but we know from experience that 6 health, 4 drops are pretty good at cleaning up early game, and then you add a mirror image to your hand. Once again, if you play the taunt, it's less likely you're going to be able to clear your board. If you can't clear your board, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You, know, you know this by now, right? The theme of the set. So anything that stalls the board, anything that freezes, anything that taunts your opponent out, makes it more likely that you're going to be able to direct the traits. If you can direct the traits, that is a very good thing in this expansion. Cool. I'm actually quite happy that the, uh, the epics they gave Mage are close to unplayable in this set. A very it's a breath of fresh air uh, from Meteor, so I, I won't really be reviewing them, but just I'll throw it out there, right? Thanks, Blizzard. Thanks for not printing it out of Meteor. Hey, Hunter time, baby, Hunter time. All right, so I am sad to not see a two-drop print for Hunter. Kind of just sad, but sad for that, because the, you know the expansion bonus is going to be there. So you might say like, yeah, Hunter has quite some twos already, and you have raised them on a previous set, but without an additional two drop, it's going to be so much harder to curve out. And as as Hunter, that's you know that's really your game plan, right? Now more than ever with all these buffs. So yeah, just sad not to see a two. But let's get started. Stitch Tracker, three mana two two. Discover a minion from your deck. 
Um, I'm not really going to count this as a curve card, but I think it's still going to be pretty good, right? Especially if you manage to get a good early curve, it's going to be a nice addition to your deck because you're going to be running out of cards anyway, and then you can play this card, uh, pull a high main from your deck, suddenly you have a lot of gas in the tank and you're ready to go. So yeah, um, I like the stitch tracker, but not necessarily on curve. So because once again, tempo is going to be so important. Contrary to that, Bear Shark is pretty good to play on curve. Uh, as, we as we said, 3 mana 4 threes are excellent at making sure you don't fall behind. And then this just has a nice upside. It can trade into a 2 health minion, which there are quite a few of, right? And the mage can't hero power it. Uh, it's at 1 HP, it can be targeted by spells or hero powers. So yeah, just nothing but good. Then Venom Strike Trap, mentioning it because it is a decent trap. I think it is worse than Snake Trap, but Snake Trap is a strong card, so it's not really fair, right, to say it's bad because it's worse than Snake Trap. Um, I think it's totally decent, right? It reminds a bit of Bear Trap, only I like Bear Trap more because it really, really punished people for hitting the face, and it seems like most people just on autopilot like, well, let's just hit the face and see what happens, right? So, um, fortunately, Venom Strike Trap won't trigger on that. Uh, but still, people should be trading into your minions, especially in this expansion. So getting a one drop into Venom Strike Trap, they trade the minion, you get the Cobra, you play that speaker, boom, right? Get quite a bit of ammo board. All right, next up, I got the Corpse Widow at a 5 and a 4, 6. This is just a solid body. On top of that, it is a beast. On top of that, it has a good ability. That is just all you need to make for a really solid card. Does it have good stats? check uh, relevant here does it have a nice trait right uh, or, or tribe or whatever it's a beast check is its effect harmful no is it useful yes all right so that's that's three things where you say boom right that's jackpot so corpse widow just strong right just a good card happy to see that for hunter uh, i can definitely see the turns where you go corpse widow fiery bat kind of grandma <laughs> Bam! <laughs> you know, speaking about tempo, All right? So yeah, uh, excited to play with the Corpse Widow. Then I'll talk about Toxic Arrow, right? I think I think it's worth mentioning, but the way how you can look at this card is it's either an arcane shot where it deals two damage and a minion um, dies, or you have to shoot your own guy to give it poisonous to then trade, where it can be compared to an inflexible Hunter's Mark. So I don't really like the card, you know, I, I do love Hunters, so obviously I'll be trying it out and naturally to find his way into my deck. Um, the arrow also can't go face, so I'm just like, I look at this card and I'm like, probably not going to be good. But, you know, I'll, get, I'll give it a shot. But from what I can see now, you know, flexibility is very useful, right? So the fact that you can use it as either, an arc either a bad arcane shot or a bad Hunter's Mark might just make the card decent, but... For now, I'm, I'm not really getting my hopes up. Cool, then we have arrived at the Druids, the last one, and uh, there's definitely some spice in this one. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot of decent cards. Uh, or, you know, <laughs> we'll save it for last. We'll save it for last, guys. All right, so at three mana, we have Nash. Now, not a crazy card. It really <laughs> reminds of Bash, even in the name. Um, worse than Bash because it doesn't uh, bypass taunt. It requires your hero to attack. But in a meta where seemingly, you know, no one gets removal, just giving Druid like, hey, you know, here's three mana, deal three damage to a thing. I'm pretty happy with that for Druid, right? It's not crazy, but you'll take it. You know, something to affect the board with. Cool. Next up, Crypt Lord. Right, we talked about how important it is that something sticks on the board for you to buff. Crypt Lord is a 3-drop with 6 health. Now, Anton is very important. Now, you might look at that card and you say, well, is it really that good? Um, deck dependent, but I think in most decks, yes, it's going to be good. Uh, because you have all these buff effects, right? You can have, like, even if you're playing um, an Arceus Protector, was that... Let me scroll down. The first card we reviewed was... Doo -doo -doo -doo. Um, Archer's, Archer's Veteran. So Archer's Veteran, even if you play that card on a Crypt, uh, on a crypt Lord, now you have a, um, a 2 and 7 taunt. That's just good, right? And it just keeps growing and keeps getting better. 
uh, especially with another card we'll be reviewing. Heck, I might as well do it now. The Strong Shell Scavenger, four mana, two, three. Give your Taunt me as plus two, plus two. If you land that on your Crypt Lord, you know, you're absolutely in business. And if you have more than one Taunt Minion, it's pretty strong. Still, I don't think it's going to be that good of a card, the Scavenger itself, just because it's so conditional and it's quite bad when it's standalone. But in the right deck, it can definitely provide for a, a nasty swing turn. Uh, mostly, you know, also assisted by the two drop Druid is getting, as I mentioned. Very important to get a two drop in your class because you're not getting them in the neutrals. And it is going to be super important to be on the board and curve out. Uh, I can't stress that enough with the cards we're getting. Uh, you have the Druid of the Swarm. And as most Druids, you get to choose one. Transform into a one and two with Poisonous or a one and five with Taunt. So here you have that one and five with Taunt potential synergy with the scavenger but i feel like most of the time you'll just make it into a one two poisonous uh, although one of five taunt for two is, is playable right um it's not amazing right but it's definitely playable uh we we know how good one and twos with poisonous are we've, we've played gastro uh, we've played gastropod uh, this one doesn't have taunt as well though so not quite as good as gastropod but you have the flexibility of making it a one five if that suits better on the board your opponent plays Lost in the Jungle, you reply with a 1-5 Taunt Druid of the Swarm. Pretty good, right? Pretty good. Whew. All right. Moving up. All right, I'm, I'm just going to I'm just going to go I'm going to go assault this one, right, guys. Ultimate Infestation. Dear lord. They just wanted to make a card. They just want to see like what can we get away with, right? What can we get away with? Now, Granted, I think that it's it's going to be such a snowball heavy meta that I think you're going to be quite far behind. A lot, of, even though there's a lot of stall in the meta, a lot of taunts. There's like if your opponent gets a bone mare off, I'm not sure if you're going to live to use your ultimate infestation properly. But in a game where you're still going quite equal on turn ten, this is an absolute game changer. I mean, just look at how many things it does, right? This is just, this is like a Kazakus potion, but better. <laughs> that's, that's pretty darn good. Uh, dealing five to something, right? Slowing down your opponent's aggression. Drawing five cards, like what? Like, just make it draw two and it still sees play, right? Make it draw two and it's still like, I feel like draw five is just crazy. All right, all right, gain five armor, you know, just to make sure you can't die at that point. And then, you know, why not? Let's just summon a 5-5 five five as well for good measure. So, like I said, I don't think it's a, a huge, huge problem, just because it feels like the way how the meta is going to play out is we're going to be snowballing and 10 mana card might be a little bit too slow, right? But um, especially if, if you're the attacker and you get to close out with a game with a card like this, or refuel, like let's just say you're an aggro do it, you've drafted one of these, your opponent barely holds off your aggression, right? And then you throw this in their face, <laughs> right? Because you can do that, deal five. <laughs> you get a five five on the board, you gain some armor and you draw five cards. It's, it's like, what? This is so, so crazy. So I feel like you can never really drop your guard against the red because when this thing comes out, you know, it's, it is an absolute game changer. All right, guys, I believe that is it. I think we've uh, talked about all the cards I wanted to talk about. Once again, a reminder, if you want to have the full card review where I go over every single card uh, as well, you know, the Death Knights, you can check out the description below the stream. Uh, that'll be the Twitch bot. Uh, it'll be my initial reaction. So the, the tone of the review might be a little different because now I've had a couple of hours to, you know, think about the cards and see how they're going to play out. If you guys enjoyed the review, please do hit like and subscribe. Let me know in the comments what you guys thought of the video. And uh, yeah, as always guys, I'll see you next time. 